I'm an associate member of T3 Trading Group, which is an SEC registered broker dealer and member of FINRA SIPC. You should carefully consider whether trading is suitable for you in light of your own financial condition. Uh, these are my positions. I added on, I added, I added a bunch of CCJ today, but I added on Cliff and, and, and Peloton. Um, let's go to the market. Why did I think that AMC was reporting tomorrow morning? Looks like it's out. Anybody seeing the numbers? You posted them? They crush it or what? All right, <clears throat> sorry guys, just a bunch of distractions coming into this. We cannot see your camera. Let me turn that on for you, sir. What'd you say? All right, we got a bunch of companies coming out right now. Uh, but, like always, let's start with our analysis of the market. Um, all right, so Spies took a really healthy rest day today, honestly. We caught that little doji on Friday in extended territory. I mean, I've been speaking about this to death. You know, we're in a market here that's extended but is just extremely bullish. Um, we kind of broke out to the upside of the ascending channel last week on the 3rd. You can see it even better in the queues. Um, you can see we're in this ascending channel and it broke out in, in a major way. So that is a signal that the market could be going parabolic. We want to be paying attention to the VIX as well. Uh, if the VIX starts upticking at the same time as the market, we potentially have a problem. And guess what? VIX has kind of been strong here for the last three days, even as the market has continued. So that's something worth noticing. But uh, I'm not going to do it again because we, we did it last week. But we made comparisons compared to... Um, this market going parabolic with two other relatively recent times in which the market has gone parabolic, uh, one of which was um, uh, late August, early September 2020, and the other was, I believe, January 2018. And we noted that, I think in the, the 2020 episode, that the, the VIX and the, and the market were rising together for like four or five days before the VIX cracked really hard. In the 2018 scenario, the market broke out of a, a, a similar uh, rising um, channel to the upside to go parabolic, but that parabolic nature of the market lasted like an entire month. So is this going to be more similar? And, and that also, by the way, led to a pretty big market correction, market crash, if you will. Um, so is this going to be similar to, you know, September, August 2020, where we're five days up and that's going to be it? Is this going to be similar to 2018, where we went up for an entire month of kind of a parabolic move before continuation, uh, before we broke down? Or is this going to be similar to the 1990s, where you could argue that you had like a year or two of, of, of parabolic action for the market before it finally went? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but what we're going to be doing here as a team is we're going to be constantly monitoring the market for the risk reward and probability of success of potentially taking the market long from where it currently is, short from where it currently is. Should we be booking profit? Should we be getting hedged? Should we be adding new positions? We'll take that day by day. So coming into today, we have this market that's become very extended in all three of our indices. Spies are extended to the upside. Qs are extended to the upside. And again, the way that I measure extension is where the market is trading between the uh, currently uh, versus the space between the 8 and 21 EMA, which I broadly consider to be the technical equilibrium for any stock or market that I'm looking at, with the uh, 80 EMA being the upper band in a rising market and the 21 EMA being the lower band of equilibrium in a rising market. And the IWM also really extended. So we're looking at all three of these indices, and we're also... Uh, trying to assess relative strength and relative weakness. So with a market that was gapping up this morning and is an extended territory, do you really want to come in and do a lot of long buying across the board, a lot of chasing? No, it's irresponsible. 
but you really want to come in and do a lot of uh, heavy short selling at this point just as soon as the market opens close your close your eyes and press the short sell button no because um, you know like we just discussed with these previous examples even though the market is uh, concerning right now because it's going up almost in a parabolic nature with the VIX itself beginning to rise we still really want to wait for a signal and even today you really didn't get a signal look how tight of a day we got we had for the spies today guess what market being really tight and going sideways after this move is more bullish than bearish now we still have some concern by this rising uh, VIX but you know you can even see here just looking at the VXX it wasn't like it was a huge up day um, for, for the VXX so that's something that we'll, we'll, con we'll continue to monitor what about the NASDAQ NASDAQ as well super tight inside day um, that's technically more bullish than bearish. It gives the market time to let these moving averages catch up. But even with today's rest day, you know, we're still $6 extended from the ADM and the Q, so it needs time. And then finally, we have our IWM. IWM was trying to be relatively strong this morning. We actually expected, um, or at least I expected, some relative strength from the IWM based on what the TLT was doing this morning. TLT pre-market was down by a good bit by the time the market opened it had bounced a little bit but TLT did stay negative really throughout the day even though it was by a small bit which means interest rates were up a little bit which is going to tend to be better for our IWM uh, and we've also spoken about how when we get that relative strength from interest rates being higher or we get relative strength from the IWM it's kind of this weird dynamic where in some in some regards it's our most value type stocks and in some ways at the exact same time it's our absolutely our, our most speculative stocks that tend to then show relative strength and tend to to rise at the same time so for myself given all of this information that we just discussed what I was really looking for more than anything else was relative strength in the IWM so I wasn't really looking at big tech today I wasn't really looking at the cubes I wasn't really looking at Apple or Microsoft so much today I was looking at uh, material names, energy stocks, especially those material names with the infrastructure uh, bill um, starting to get passed through the government. And at the same time, I'm also was looking at, uh, at a lot of these speculative type names to see if, if they could give a run. Your, you know, your 3D printing names and your Jumais and, you know, that whole list of stocks that we go to all the time, Palantir and Jumai and Skills and, um, you know, a lot of the Kathy Wood type stocks, if you will. So looking at all that stuff at the same time, and it turned out to be a really interesting day because if you look at some of these names like we spoke about, Triple D today. Uh, is Triple D just getting crushed here after hours? Wow. Yeah, so Triple D is now getting crushed after hours on its earnings report. But uh, And that was the reason why I ended up not trading it was because one of you guys informed me that it was going to be reporting earnings after hours. But otherwise, I was just going to use this as an example. Triple D here with an inside day, and you look at that inside day and up in a, in a stock that's been relatively strong, and you see that you were able to still get some sort of continuation on that as you know, one of those uh, speculative type stocks. Or maybe we're better off looking at something that is not... Uh, Triple D because it's getting crushed here on earnings. Uh, Tilray is another example. Another one of those speculative type stocks just caught uh, a really big upside day today. And again, that's despite what the market did. Palantir. Palantir broke through 26.50. Gave really strong continuation. And it's on a day when the market took a rest. Will, now here's an interesting question. A bunch of those types of stocks just reported earnings here after hours, and most of them seem like they're down. This SDC, which I have never liked this company, is getting absolutely crushed on its earnings report. Uh, Triple D here looks like it's down 7-8% on its earnings report. Um, I think there was one other that you guys just posted that was, that was garbage. Uh, but you got AMC that's initially trading higher here after hours as well. That just ticked up to almost $48. Um, I haven't looked at the numbers yet on, on these guys. I'm seeing you guys are saying ATER is popping. Yeah, I don't know if this is earnings also, but ATER here um, is uh, definitely one of those speculative type stocks, and that, that's also gapping up really big. Uh, Roblox, I do consider this Roblox to be a speculative name as well. I've been very bullish on this one, and it's trading above 100, 100, 100 bucks. So on the one hand, you know, we're looking at those speculative names today, and if anybody caught any of them, some of them gave pretty big moves. On the other hand, I was looking at these material names. I kept a little bit of this CLF, even though it didn't close great. Honestly, they were a little bit of a disappointment. I know we were particularly looking at CLF and X today 
as material stocks because I've been a fan of that CLF for a while. And the chart on, on this US deal here looks great. So we discussed trying to go long X, I believe versus 27 was kind of the initial trade idea. And then you could have tightened that stop up pretty quickly. You could have gotten some stock here versus 27, and then pretty quickly you could have tightened your stop up to lows. But this one was particularly disappointing, even more disappointing than CLF. You know, 100% retracement, but kind of held its lows, and then eventually it lost those lows and you know, traded weak. And this is not, this is not a great looking candle here for U.S. Steel. CLF is the one I kept a very small position on, um, very small. Uh, you know, I, I like this company as a whole, and we discussed in the morning meeting today going long versus $23. Similar kind of disappointment with a not great close on this, and this daily candle is really not fantastic for a swing trade, even as I've kept a little bit. But it great, gave a great opening drive trade here if you were being long versus that 23 that we discussed. Pretty quickly, you're able to raise your stop to that opening low. I think everybody knows I love those opening momentum trades. The pullback here was not unhealthy, but maybe a little bit deeper than we would like. But really, it's just a pullback between the 8 and 21 EMA on the five minute chart. So just equilibrium here, where it pivots and then didn't give any continuation is really kind of where the disappointment came in. Uh, so we're looking at those. I was also looking at these energy names today. Also a little bit disappointed with the close in these energy stocks. But again, this is why we have our big picture game plan. Because with the spies, the Qs, the IWM, this extended, it's hard to expect a lot of real follow through in any individual names. But I thought maybe an XLE type sector where there's value here could show relative strength on a day like today. And even as the spies and Qs and IWM are all extended, the XLE was not coming into today and had a, a potential breakout here above like 58.50 or so. So that's kind of the area we're looking at. But also this one, just a disappointing close. You know, kind of great opening trade uh, versus that 58.50 and then just rolls over, makes new lows. And, and you know, that's why, again, going back to the big picture, we do it. Because we knew that we needed to be a little bit cautious coming into today. And you still try to pick your spots, whether name is in play or, you know, we're looking, or you're looking for relative strength to come in, which is what I was looking for. And any one of those trades, whether it's the energy name, CLF, US Steel, they all gave you a big enough move where you really should be profitable in them as long as you executed properly. So uh, th those are those kind of stocks, even though they give no follow through. My focus today, I focused on CCJ. That was one of my ideas for the morning meeting today. Um, I really like this pattern. So first of all, we got involved in it as a team. I know a bunch of you guys have it with me on November 3rd. Uh, November 3rd here, it got upgraded. And I remember talking about, well, 27 is the real level, but I think maybe I want to try to get a head start on this 27 level, be specifically because of the upgrade. So again, that's where we combine our technicals with our news. Uh, so got upgraded really nicely. I think my price was like 25.75, something like that. We caught a great move back to that 27 resistance. It spent basically three days consolidating up here, which is fine, especially because there was extension, extension into resistance. So it struggled at this 27 um, Thursday and Friday last week. Friday it actually gave, and I, I really like this pattern. It gave a little bit of a price correction into the ADMA, but tailed back up to close at 27. And then today it gapped up pretty big. And my only concern about this in the morning meeting, in the morning meeting I think it was trading at like 27.70, my only concern about it in the morning meeting was maybe this thing is gapping up too much and it's taking away a lot of the, the reward potential. So I wanted to try to buy a little bit of a dip or get, get a better risk reward. And we discussed a couple different potential outs. I felt that the ideal like swing stop out on this thing is Friday's low, uh, which is 26.41. My original stop is Wednesday's low from when I got into it. Now, because of today's price action, I think I can raise my original stop to Friday's low. So I'm locking in some extra money for myself by raising this stop to 26.41. And we were able to get the upside continuation today. And let me add, look, I got really lucky and, and I love doing this sometimes because I know I've said this in some other afternoon meetings, we all love to focus on when we, when we get stopped out of positions by like one penny. And you know, easily I could have had my stop at $27 today and the low of the day is $27, it gets stopped out and it works. It didn't happen. My stop was at $27, $27 one cent is the uh, low and I didn't get stopped out. Not only did I not get stopped out, I actually got filled on the bid 
at $27.01. With a stop loss of $27, I, I think I took, a, I initially bought um, like $27.22 or something like that on the way down because I was like, oh, I really like this name. I really like this daily, daily chart is set, setting up. I didn't want to chase 2770 where we were looking at in the morning meeting, but it dipped real hard and was kind of filling that gap. And I was like, okay, you know, kind of coming into this high zone from Friday's high here. Let me buy some in the 2720s and risk it down to $27 on an ad. Not, and, and, and again, this is an ad, not an ad back. So we talk about the difference a lot between an ad and an ad back. The, the actually, the bid that I had at 2701 was an ad back. The buy I took at 2722 uh, or whatever was an ad. So what I'm doing is I'm treating those as two separate trades. I now have this tighter trade with this tighter stop loss at 27, but I also have a different game plan for the stock that I am still in from Wednesday last week where I'm raising my stop to Friday's low That and that game plan called for me to add back a small amount of stock, basically at 27. Well, I, I can't have a stop loss and a bid at the same price. So, you know, I, I, I have my bid at 2701, and this is like a miracle. I got filled on the bid at 2701. My stop never triggers at 27. And then it gives this big uptick, lets me cover my risk, pulls back again more than I would like, but then just goes in this grindy uptrend for the rest of the day. Uh, so this worked out, honestly, really well. I got a little bit lucky to be able to have all that extra added stock and not get stopped out of it. And that's obviously great as well. And now I can have still the $27 stop loss from my ad on my swing. And I can have the $26.40 uh, stop loss for my original core position. And that's, I'm raising that stop. So, you know, I'm solidly in a win-win situation with, uh, with CCJ right now. So that was a focus for me for sure. Another focus for me um, ended up being this Peloton. And Peloton was not easy at all today. Um, I kind of started with a very small uh, feeler position that I was giving some room to and then I was looking for spots to get heavier and I was you know trading this one out loud here with the team a lot um, but also kind of commenting that you know maybe it's only day two maybe it's not ready. I I'm probably a little bit too biased towards the stock. Um, their last earnings report was terrible and it's down huge on it but I know that both 50 and 40 our levels for Peloton. Uh, it broke out from the 50 level back in 2020, back in June 2020, you can see it was a really big level here. So I'm like, oh, is that previous resistance gonna hold a support? And then you actually have a, a support level, which was resistance and then became support at 40 as well. So I started, um, you know, working into this Peloton as kind of an initial feeler and then looking to get heavier, heavier on it. I, I was honestly being very selective on sizing up on this thing and I took like four trades where I took some serious size on it and uh, got stopped out of every single one after at least covering my risk. So I had several trades here and each time I was able to have really tight risk on it and that, if anything that was the problem, the risk was so tight because the sell off was so orderly and then it, it, it never capitulated, it just eventually kind of rounded up and started to work out a little bit a little bit better. But I was looking for a bigger move back to like $56. I definitely never got that. You know, I caught this nice little bounce back to almost 52. Uh, tried to get heavier on a few occasions, never was able to get super heavy in it, but still kind of have an okay position. I traded it well today. I don't have a huge profit cushion in it, but I decided to swing some. Um, I, I probably would like a little bit of a better profit cushion to be swinging normally. But between the degree of extension and the bullish option flow that we saw come into Peloton into the close, uh, it made me decide to uh, keep some and, and add Peloton as a swing trade. And I'm still just going to look for the bounce back to 56 bucks. And there's a little bit of a tail down there to lows, though it's not major at all. But it gives me a little bit of breathing room down to today's low that I could be using as a as a potential stop loss. So, so Peloton is definitely a big focus of mine today. Again, you know, I'm trying to focus on stocks on days like today that I think are gonna be lesser correlated to the market because they're trading on a news event like Peloton still is or because I'm expecting uh, relative strength to be able to come in. That's why I was looking at material names, value names, speculative names. That's why, you know, trading that CCJ, loving that daily chart. And um, you know, with all that said, I, I, I wouldn't say that today was like a stupendous day, which 
We've honestly had a lot of fantastic days as a team over the course of the last several weeks. It's been kind of ridiculous, actually, how good things have been. Um, and I wouldn't say that today was a spectacular day, but but there was some opportunity to definitely get a living for yourself if you were selective on what names that you focused on and you know try to focus on things that were, were in play and, and picture spots a little bit. So I ended up being able to make a few bucks for myself today, and um, I'm happy to take it. And that is all I've got uh, for you guys. So with that said, happy to take a look at what you guys are looking at. Um, let me try to scroll up into the VTF. There's so much information on here on all the different earnings reports. I'm going to look at that after. Triple D, AMC, TRIP, Real Real, CLOV. Um, first thing I'm seeing here is from Cody at about 4.19 p.m. So if anybody posted a question before that, just repo repost it. Uh, from Cody. Could MAPS, M-A-P-S, run with weed stocks? What is MAPS? Weed MAPS. Weed MAPS? It's like, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, Our resident, uh, marijuana expert, Josh. <laughs> is letting me know that weed maps is like Yelp for for marijuana. Um, sure, I, I don't I don't see why it wouldn't uh, run with the weed stocks a little bit. What, what's what's the weed ETF that was running today? MSOS. MSOS. Yeah, and I know we looked at the holdings of this. I think it's got a ton of pink sheets in it as well. Um, not a great looking close on this candle. Tilray was the real winner today. And CGC actually got downgraded this morning. But CGC, considering it got downgraded, this is a great day for CGC to be able to negate Friday's candle, which I think was, was that earnings Friday? Yeah. Yeah, it was earnings on Friday. Uh, so this is a great, I think, snapback for CGC, but it really needs to start getting back above 14. Tilray, Til Tilray looks solid. Uh, but as far as weed maps goes, yeah, I mean, I, I would think if the whole sector if you will, starts doing well, that this will also. Um, I love Friday's candle. I love this tail. I like when they do this. They shook everybody out on Friday. Anybody who was trying to be long off the support got shaken out, but it's still closed above, and it's that high volume tail, and now it's back above it. So I actually really like um, the internal technicals of what happened Friday into today, but now it's entering into the prove yourself stage. It's got to get above uh, 1250 initially. That's clearly some resistance on a closing basis above 1250. And then it really needs to get back above 1350, negate this negative Marabozu, get above these moving averages, and then it'll start to look a lot better. Uh, but I don't know a lot about MAPS as a company. And honestly, if it's the Yelp of the marijuana industry, I'm not a fan of Yelp. So uh, <laughs> we'll see about that. Um, Firm is down on the PayPal Amazon. I don't even know what the PayPal Amazon news is. I'm gonna have to look at all that after after the afternoon meeting. There's too much going on for me. Uh, Gabriel letting us know that Palantir reports earnings tomorrow. Thank you for that. Uh, next I'm seeing here is from Michael H on YouTube. Hey Derek, lots of chop today. Could you look at GLD? Looking like it's ready for a run. Well, I'm sure the gold bugs in the VTF because I got a few of them are happy to hear your comment about thinking it's ready to run. Um, so my thought process on gold is that it's been really sloppy for a while now, and as a result, I've been staying away from it. Uh, I caught a really good move in this updraft in gold. I was actually trading JNUG, um, you know, the Leverage Junior Gold Miner ETF, and, and it's funny because I've always hated on JNUG, but because of that trade, it's one of the best, if not the best, trades and names of my career when I was able to catch that JNUG on the way up. But then this gold topped out, and I remember it, it created this uh, descending um, triangle. It broke down from that descending triangle, and it's been super sloppy ever since then. So basically, ever since it topped out here in August 2020, gold's been super sloppy. And I keep telling the gold bugs in the VTF, because I got a few of them, that I, I just want the technicals to prove themselves to me before I start looking at this. And we're getting there. Um, this price action back into this resistance zone, 
and I would call it a resistance zone, probably between like 170 and 170, 150 for GLD. This price action into it is solid. You know, f four big up days in a row back into resistance. But now, similar to the last stock I was just going over, I know this is not a stock, I, it's improve yourself zone. Get above this resistance zone because every time you get out into this area and it's been sloppy, it fails. So if you start seeing this GLD start really clearing above like 171, 171.50 on a closing basis, then it starts to look fantastic. I don't think I would jump into this right now after four big up days in a row into resistance. If you're already in it, you're probably in a good spot if you're in, you know, from a good price. And if you're not already in it, I think I would just be patient and see what it does as it's become a little bit extended into the broader kind of resistance area. Uh, so that's gold. Let, let, let's take a... Um, Oh, my brain is just not working today. Uh, GDX. Uh, let's take a look at GDX real quick, the gold miner ETF, and see what this thing looks like. Yeah, I think this thing's still sloppy too. I, I, I need this GDX to get back above 35, really. Clear. You got some resistance here at 34, which coincides with the 200 day, and then you've got bigger resistance at this 35. I need this GDX to start clearing above 34, 35 in conjunction with GLD looking better, clearing the resistance we just discussed. And I think that this area starts looking a lot better and we can start potentially um, taking a look at it again. Uh, so that is that. <laughs> yeah, Gabriel. Uh, next year from Sebastian uh, asking, this is a great question from Sebastian. Sebastian is saying in CCJ, if the support is 27, why would you put your stop loss there? Wouldn't it be twenty six ninety nine at least? That's a fantastic, fantastic question. I do both. I sometimes we'll put the stop loss at the whole number, and I'll sometimes put the stop loss at twenty six ninety nine. And I'll tell you the the reasoning and the difference why is liquidity. Um, twenty seven dollars. I, I I actually generally prefer to use my stop losses where there is liquidity to limit slippage. Um. Especially more on a breakout. It's a little bit different because it was a stop loss on like a support trade. So you easily could have used 2699. But you know, if I'm using a stop loss as an entry for a breakout, then I really prefer to use the whole number where the liquidity is. This is the opposite. This is like a stop loss as an out at support. So using 2699 makes a lot of sense here. But for me it was still a situation of, of liquidity. Um for some reason, I just got a NVIDIA alert. Is NVIDIA trading down right now? No, it's a false false alert. Uh, so anyway, back to CCJ. The situation of liquidity. You know, I, I bought a bunch of stock, um, however many thousands of shares, versus $27. And there was liquidity at $27. And the na this name can trade kind of thin. So I was trying to utilize the liquidity, the bids that were there at $27 for my stop loss to limit slippage on the out. Um, and, that, and that's the reason. You know, I don't remember exactly how much was at $27 today on the bid, but let's say maybe it was 10,000 shares. So let's say that I had 4,000 shares versus 27, there's 10,000 shares there. If, if my stop's at 26.99, I'm, I'm gonna get all kinds of slippage probably on that out. If my stop is at 27, the hope here is I'm able to clip that liquidity that was at $27 to limit my slippage. So that was really the extent of my reasoning there, uh, Sebastian and CCJ. But but technically for that stop, $26.99 is just fine. Um, and again, it's really more on the breakout side, the entry side, where I'm usually looking to limit that slippage a little bit more. But but that's why I did it here. Uh, next from Kosh. Uh, Roblox tried to buy small at 88 and couldn't get filled. Um, I need to learn how to trade after market. Any chance we can get a short class on in the near future? Okay. Um, I can I can go over some brief points about trading after hours. The the first thing I'm going to say to you guys is not to do it if you're a new trader, and not to do it if you have a small account. Uh, small accounts are obviously relative, um, but that's the first thing I'm going to say to you guys. Um, you gotta understand. The trading after hours is a very different dynamic than trading during market hours. This stock 
you know, they're ripping this thing up here initially, you're trying to buy $88, and they flip around and they miss on some metric that you didn't see come out yet, and instantly you're getting filled on the bid at 88 and the thing's instantly at 82. And if you're not comfortable with the amount of stock that you were buying, potentially being down six bucks in this thing in two minutes, and not even having the opportunity to get out, because you can't use stop losses after hours, if you're comfortable with that, okay, then you know what? Take the trade. If you're not comfortable with that, you don't belong trading this. Um, it's really important that traders are aware that stop orders do not work outside of market hours. If you are trading outside of 9.30 to 4, which I do, you can't use stop losses. You have to be able to manually hit out. And your market orders are not going to work because the market's closed. Also, you can't route to certain ways. You can't route to the New York Stock Exchange, right? We have direct market access as professional traders here at T3 Trading Group. If you try to route to the New York Stock Exchange after hours, nothing is gonna happen. And then other exchanges drop off at 6 p.m., whereas other exchanges continue to 8 p.m. I think uh, BATS, EDGEX, and EDGE, I think drop off at 6 o'clock. So if it's 6.05 and you try to hit out by by using, and I think a lot of people use EDGE A to take liquidity, nothing is gonna happen. So you gotta really understand routing. Um, you gotta, you know, trading, what, what I do is, uh, let's say I was long 100 shares of Roblox, which I'm not. And right now it's trading, you know, 98.86 by $99. Let's say I wanted to use 98.50 as my air quote stop loss. I can't use the stop loss. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna take an offer and I am gonna cross it all the way down to like 96.50, $2 through the market. And if Roblox trades down to 88 bucks, which is where I wanna get stopped out, the second I see a tick into that 98.50 where I want my stop to be, I'm pressing enter as fast as I can to cross the bids with my offer to be able to liquidate the position. If you didn't follow what I just said, don't trade after hours. If, if you know you're not experienced not enough yet to be able to understand everything I just said the way I said it, don't trade after hours. It's very high risk, high reward. I personally enjoy trading after hours. It tends to give me a strong advantage. It tends to be a lot about tape reading, which it's one of the few circumstances where tape reading is still really important. I have that as a skill. So it's, it's you know beneficial to me. I tend to do really well after hours generally, but there have been a few times trading after hours where I have gotten absolutely, absolutely smoked. And usually it's like what I just described. Stock is trading up to 88 bucks. You're like, oh, I, I, I still like it. Let me get in. And the second you're getting in, your bid gets filled. This thing is in a blink of an eye down below 80 bucks. And you're just like, oh my God, what do I do? I was planning on getting out at 86 and it's at, it's at 79 and it's $7 past my stop loss. I, I remember I, I, I had that happen a very bad one time in Facebook on size after hours. Um, Facebook was down a ton on its earnings report however many years ago after hours. And then uh, Zuckerberg said something on the conference call. And it was down a ton and it was stabilizing a little bit and I was trading it long versus some post market like support level or buyer or something like that I saw and it was down huge and then Zuckerberg said something and like in the blink of an eye like I, I pressed my enter button to cross the market I didn't get filled and in the blink of an eye the thing was down like twenty dollars past where I wanted to get stopped out um, and I, I got I got demolished on the trade so you got to be very very careful trading after hours but that is how it works that's how it works, is what you need to know. Uh, so that's cash. Um, yeah. Weed Maps is heavily used in California. Learn from a friend. <laughs> uh, from Brent. Uh, can you talk about your trying to size up in Peloton and not being able to, and not being able to a little to help understand what would have allowed you to? Sure. So, um, so on Peloton today, there was a couple of occasions where I was able to size up 
and you know get my risk covered and then get stopped out. That happened like three or four times. And there was a couple of other trades that I was really eyeing where I, I, I just didn't, I either didn't see the right signal to actually execute or I did and I was just a little bit too late and, and wasn't able to get my price and I didn't really want to chase price. So there were a few occasions where I was definitely talking to the VTF and I was like, man, I'm you know, trying to get heavier here, but I didn't get filled or I, I want to get heavier, but I'm just waiting for that signal and I'm not really seeing the signal. So that happened on a few occasions. Um, let me try to figure out where I was trading this thing. It's so hard to see with my execution dots on where I actually was getting heavier and where I wasn't because I traded this thing so much. Uh, uh, was it the fifth or 50? What's this low here? Yeah, I definitely remember off this this candle right here. Um, this bar right here where the low is 50.88 and the volume picked up. So this is actually the biggest volume bar of the day. Uh, so it broke through 51. Put in stop of 50.88, and I bought it back through 51 with the 12, 13 cents worth of risk, and there was enough of a pop. I mean, the, the high of this candle is only 51.50, but there was enough of a pop here. Where I was able to. I think it. I think it bounced to like 51.17 or something like that only. I was able to get my risk covered and I got stopped out. So that was one of the spots where I was able to get heavier. There was another one where. Here, I, I almost didn't get it, and then I did. So, so there's a couple of ways that I sometimes do this, um, just to talk ab out loud about it. Uh, one is is more dangerous than the other, but can give you like better pricing. So, if I if I see a level like like 50 bucks, right? We know 50 bucks was definitely a level for this thing. We could see it on the daily technicals. It's also a nice round psychological number that the stock is really beaten down into. So you can see here when it broke fifty dollars here, the low here was forty nine eighty five. So there's a couple, a couple of things I like to do. One of the things that I really always teach you guys, and I forget, I think it might have been Gabriel that I was communicating with um, while we were actually trading it, who who bought it back up through fifty one on this, um, and I, and we were communicating that you know my price was actually forty nine eighty seven, and he bought back through fifty. And I said that what he did was the right thing, and it is. So one of the things I like to do when I see a big level like that break is I'll buy it back up through the level. So I see that it broke. I see this, the low is 49.85. I'll put a buy stop really quick at $50 or $50 and one cent. And then I'll buy it back on the way up because again, we don't wanna catch falling knives. It's the same thing with the shorting, right? Which I've been given a lot more warnings on shorting and not really giving warning on, warnings on buying because the market's so strong. You know, when we're shorting these extended markets, you can't just short and hope it goes down because it's extended. And it's the same thing with Peloton. I can't just buy Peloton because it's so extended on the daily chart and just buy it and be like, all right, I'm gonna make money because it's extended. It's not gonna work that way. Um, and I don't wanna catch a falling knife. I wanna be buying on the way up. Even if I'm buying on the way up on a very small time frame, I'm still buying on the way up. So usually what I would preach here is buy this back through $50. Have your stop loss of fifty dollars. Have your stop loss of fifty dollars and one cent, um, and then you know exactly where your stop loss is going to be once it gets. So first of all, if the thing just craters, you're never even going to get entered into it. So you're not going to lose any money. Second of all, if you do get entered into it, you get enter entered into an uptick. It's it's moving higher, even if it's only moved higher by fifteen cents and it's down. $50, it's still moving higher and you're getting entered and you have a very clear stop loss level that you can be trading at versus. I think that's what Gabriel did and that's that's definitely one of the right things to do. Now there's another thing I do sometimes do, which I was trying to do in a couple circumstances today. I'm very selective in doing this and I, I wanna start by saying that this is dangerous. I'm not recommending people do this. I'm telling you what I sometimes do. Sometimes into these bigger levels like this, you know that there's gonna be a lot of stop losses that get triggered, right? You can just imagine how many people had stop losses at $50 or $49.99 in Peloton today for obvious reasons. It's a level, it's a psychological number, all that good stuff. It's breaking lows at that point on the day. You know, this, this previous low here is um, $50.21. So 
So all the buyers, I mean, just look at these candles right here. All the buyers who bought in front of the $50 support level are buying here, all the day traders, and they're getting stopped out here. So what I will sometimes do is I will put in a bid that's out of the money to try to take advantage of those stops, come in on the other side of those stops. So what I, what I did here was I actually had a bid for 2,000 shares at $49.82. Figuring, all right, when this thing breaks through this 50 bucks, I'm actually gonna come in on the opposite side, I'm gonna try to get filled on that stock, see what the what that immediate low is. Maybe I get filled at you know, 49.82, the low is 49.75, so I got seven cents of risk versus what off that immediate low, and I'm quickly gonna throw out 1,000 shares at $49.92. And then the other thousand shares I'll keep, and then my risk is covered, and I'll see what happens. So that's what I was trying to do here. And what happened was that the low on the break, surprisingly, and this is actually bullish, was only 49.85. It should have been, it should have been an even bigger sweep through of all those stop losses. That kind of shows you that there were some other buyers there kind of coming and taking that liquidity. So what I quickly did was I, I paged up my bid as fast as I could to 49.87. And I got partialed for like 926 shares. And then it uptick real quick. And then I got filled the rest, which actually made me nervous. Because I shouldn't have I shouldn't have gotten filled the rest. I probably should have canceled my bid once I got partialed. But I got filled the rest. And then same thing. It got above 50 bucks. It put in a high of $3.17. I was able to actually more than cover my risk on this. And then it broke new lows and it stopped and, it, and I got stopped out of that stock. So that was like the third time maybe I tried it. And now when it I remember talking about this out loud. The break of this new low, the break of 49.85, believe it or not, was actually more violent than the break of 50 bucks, which surprised me. But that, the, the violence is more, so it's more potential capitulatory action. On the one hand, it's bullish that it didn't break down as much as it, as it did here, because it shows that the buyers came in right away. On the other hand, you know, you, you want that capitulatory action to really kind of give you more of a signal. When the selling is very orderly, or the buying is very orderly, like when we were trying to shorten a video the other day, or at least me and Pat were, we don't recommend that one either. Um, the real top didn't come in until it got crazy, right? And the volume really picked up. So I actually tried to do the same thing on the break of 49.50, because that breakthrough 49.85 was actually really violent. It came down to 49.50, there was liquidity at 49.50. So I was like, let all this liquidity get hit, let these people get stopped into this 49.50, and I'll do the same thing. So I had a bid at 49.42 that time. Didn't get filled, low is 49.45, and then it started to pop without me. And now that it started to pop without me, I'm canceling my bid. Pop without me, I cancel my bid. If it ever comes back down to that price, it's probably going down even lower. So I'm not trying to do that again. So that was an example of a time that I tried to get heavier, but I couldn't get the stock. Um, and, then, and then that was the last time I tried. I, there was one other time, actually. There was one other time where the same thing happened. At these new lows here at 49.25, I think I had a, another 2,000 share bid at 49.22. And again, I didn't get filled, and I gave the pop, and I canceled it. I canceled that. So when it went back down there eventually, and it actually broke 49.11, I, I when put, put in a low 49.11, I was never getting heavier into that. So then I just had my kind of core position that I kind of had for a while um, that I was working back and forth for, for the actual pop. And, uh, you know, it ended up being an okay trade for me. But none of my heavier ads, all my heavier ads, either, either I didn't get filled or they didn't work. But at least every time they didn't work, I was able to execute well enough that I was able to at least be break even on the trade, if not make money. So that's kind of what was going on there in Peloton. Uh, scrolling through here, I have no idea what Aaron is saying. <laughs> oh, video on after hours, make us more, give us more, make us more dangerous. Uh, again, I'm just gonna really suggest people don't trade after hours. <laughs> uh, Sebastian, also, can you look at DKS? Sure, buddy. Uh, are you still in from this day when you called it out or you asked about it in the afternoon meeting? So it's, I think it looks okay. You know, it's holding in pretty well. The ADMA is caught up now to these lows. We, we want to see this go. 
It took a rest day today along with the market, but it's at that point where we want to see it go. Uh, I would just stick with your game plan, stick with your stop loss. Uh, next year from Brent. Some are saying that this year is heating up after hours like it never has before. You see it changing for the better too. Now, I, I don't see any difference in after hours trading recently compared to any other time in my career. Um, from you seeing any inputs in the Apple price action today? Uh, I really didn't look at it. So um, in our morning meeting today, we discussed not focusing on the big tech, tech names today. Though I did briefly in the morning meeting take a look at them. Uh, you know, Apple, as long as it's continuing to hold above 150 bucks, looks good. I don't like, it's kind of two things here going on in Apple at the same time. On the one hand, Apple's not extended like the Qs are. So that's a good thing. But on the other hand, the reason it's not more extended than the Qs are is because it's been relatively weak. It's a bad thing. So while it's holding above 150, I think it looks okay. We don't want to lose this 150. I don't love today's candle. Today's an inside day, but it closed on lows. It's pretty weak. It could be potentially setting up for a break of this 150. If the Q's price correct deeper, this Apple's probably going to lose 150. And it doesn't look great. So I, I don't think I would do it. If you're not involved in Apple right now, I think I would still wait and still be patient. Um, if you are involved in it, you, don't, you really don't want to see this thing lose 150 on a closing basis. So that is that. Uh, Gabriel here. So if it reclaims 50, I enter and move my stop to right below 50. No, keep your stop at lows. Yeah, keep your stop at lows, Gabriel. You did the right thing. Uh, cannot see the chart behind your video. Ching Chingus, you gotta start try restarting your VTF. Sometimes that happens. What? Oh, my bad. The sunset here in New York City is beautiful today. I just looked out the window. I don't, know if, I don't think you guys were able to see that through the camera. No, you're just seeing my charts. Oh, yeah, through that window a little bit. I eh, can't really tell. Um, anyway, anyway, Brent is in Alaska, so after hours trading is, is appealing. You just got to wake up early, Brent. I love trading when I was in California. I know Alaska is even worse. Um, but I loved it in California. But what I do when I'm out west is I, I like literally keep my clocks on New York time. Especially in winter, it's easy to do. Um, because it's dark all the time anyway. So the time it is can be whatever time you want it to be. So I, I set my clocks out there, in, especially in the winter when I was in California last winter for like a few months. I literally was just uh, pretending I was on, it was New York hours. But I was in this magical place which was Lake Tahoe it was awesome I was in Lake Tahoe for uh, all of November all of December and, and some of January it was sick uh, right by Heavenly and, and Kirkwood um, basically like the South Lake Tahoe area Any, anyway um, looks like I got through the questions it's after five o'clock so I'm gonna call it uh, sorry about the technical difficulties getting the meeting started today. Hopefully the tech team and I can have things figured out going forward because I'm going to be streaming the afternoon meetings through Derek the Trader and not T3 Live. So if you don't follow Derek the Trader on YouTube, give it a follow. Give it a subscribe. See you guys next time. Have a great night.